So, um, this part of my uh, lecture is about my own uh, research area. Uh, actually, one of my research areas, uh, I've worked in other areas as well, in uh, software engineering and uh, related areas, configuration management, mobile code, uh, distrib distributed experimentation, testing. Um, but this, this is the one I like the best. It's my favorite research area. So, um, so this is a title that tries to <coughs> appeal to your intuition, but put an emphasis on the real interesting uh, problems. So the intuition is event processing, and maybe I should have written here, publish, subscribe, if anybody knows what that means. But the part that is interesting for me is the network part. So let me tell you what the, uh, what the story is about. And to do that, I would like you to focus on what the traditional networks do. Traditional networks do pretty much these two things. One is similar to a telephone service, and one is similar to a postal service. Uh, if you study network books, these things are called connection-oriented or um, uh, connection-oriented services, and this is connectionless services. So what does that mean? Well, it means the following things. If you have a network, you have a bunch of applications. The applications are given numbers, like phone numbers. So when application 4 wants to call, say, application 3, uh, no, say application 2, it dials the phone number. So it says, send a message to 456. And what does the network do? It delivers the message to 456. And if it's a connection-oriented uh, service, it establishes the connection so that now they can directly communicate without needing any further addressing. If it's connectionless, it's just an individual message. But the nature of the service is the same. You, application on one end, are given a number. You get the phone number when you subscribe for your phone provider. And somebody has to dial your number to talk to you. Okay? Pretty basic, it works, it's extremely useful for many applications. That's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in a different service. Uh, this, by the way, can be, this type of service can be um, a unicast or multicast. What is network multicast? Well, multicast is your phone number, it's not just your phone number, but it's a phone number that represents a group. Okay, so. Uh, Many applications have their own phone number, but they also join a group. So, for example, application 3 joins group 789 and 666 and 777, and application 1 uh, joins 123 and 666. So, if application 4 wants to send to, say, group 666, then the network, what does the network do? It delivers to all the members of the group, 666. There's variations of this model in IPv6. There's also these addresses called anycast addresses, uh, meaning that in that case, it wouldn't send, the network would not send a message to all of them. It would send a message to any one of them. And you understand that that's useful for many applications. Say, if you're on the web, and you want to talk to Google, or you want to talk to the closest printer in, in the room, uh, you can address the Google group. You can address the local printer group. And the system will find it, wherever that might be. You don't need to talk to a specific address. It'll talk to that one within that group. But in any case, all that the network does is that it looks up an address that is set by the sender. The sender puts a message with an address in it. Okay? And the network delivers it. Okay? I'm interested in a model that is described very well in the public subscribe uh, mode of communication. What is, anybody uh, has ever heard of the term publish subscribe? Okay, I'll tell you about it. In the publish subscribe model is, um, uh, is a similar that you brought up uh, with RSS. Uh, it is receivers that they tell the network what they want. 
the receiver decides that he or she is interested in some kind of information, and they tell the network that's, a, that, that's the, what they want. So they subscribe. Once they subscribe, senders tell the network simply what they have to offer. In other words, they publish. They simply send the information out to the network without telling the network where to send the information. So they publish. What does the network do? Well, in the first case, the network was simply looking at the message and saying, oh, I need to send it to this address. Now, the network has no address. The network has the content of the message, and it has to match the content of the message with the preferences of the receivers. Okay, this is the public subscribe model, and this is the kind of communication that I'm interested in. So the network, or the system, or the broker, um, dispatcher, whatever you want to call it, delivers every publication to the interested subscribers. Now, if you think of uh, this public subscribe thing, it looks like IP multicast, right? It looks like IP multicast because joining a group could be thought of, could be equivalent to. Um, joining an IP group to subscribe it to everything that is published on that group. If you look at RSS feeds, yes, if I join an RSS feed, uh, it means that I'm subscribing to the feed. I'm interested in whatever gets published in that feed. Uh, and so you can see this. However, there's a fundamental difference, and this is the, the cornerstone of this whole research area, in my opinion, is the part that interests me the most. The difference is, when you subscribe, you really don't subscribe for a number. You don't subscribe for a channel. That's, that's like listening to the radio. You don't just tune into a radio station. You want some specific information, regardless of the channel where they're published. So, let's say, <coughs> I like um, rock music. But I also like uh, airplanes. Oh, and I like, uh, you know, soccer. So there isn't a single channel that offers those things. Or maybe there are some channels that offer one thing and the other thing, not the third one. Uh, or maybe there's multiple channels that offer soccer information or electric guitars or airplanes. Uh, but I want that information. So for me, it's easy to express that interest to say, look, I'm interested in electric guitars, jet airplanes, and AC Milan, okay? Let me know whenever something is published on electric guitars, uh, jet airplanes, and AC Milan. You know, what's wrong with that? That's exactly it. That's what the network is supposed to do. So to me, the whole point is that, oops, it is beautiful. The whole point is that <coughs> publish subscribe is interesting because it's content-based. Publish subscribe differs from IP multicast because it's content based. And so the key word in this whole talk is content based. What I propose is effectively to put information about the content inside the network so that the network can do routing, can distribute the information based on the content. Yes? And uh, what's wrong, Frank? Uh, I mean, it's a time approach, but we have a IP multicast addresses. Yes. Some number. Them, yeah. Not a lot of, yeah. and uh, we have classes for these addresses which represent a particular topic. Yeah. If you want, uh, for IPv6, it's not good. Just uh, for IPv4, it's not good because we have not enough addresses. Yeah. For IPv6, it's better. Yeah. But uh, why doesn't this work? It doesn't. You have an answer to that question? What? Oh, okay. Hold it. Um, this. Is, is a good approach. It's an approach that has been uh, already proposed by several people, mapping the content onto a set of addresses. In my opinion, it doesn't work for a bunch of reasons. First, you have to allocate the IP addresses in advance. So you have to decide, I have to use this IP address for this content, or this IP address for this group of contents. Okay, so you have to structure that information. Second, if a publisher wants to publish something that is a cross-cutting subject, a subject that can fit in both one content unit and another content unit, what do they do? Flags or something. Right. When, uh, 
the clock or so back addresses can intersect. No, they cannot. They cannot, yeah. So what do you do? You, if you want to, well, you can choose. I said, I should move. Uh, <coughs> Good. So the receiver subscribes to both. Okay? Okay. In the center? Publish twice. Publishes twice. Yeah. This can be solved. It's of course, it can be solved. <laughs> of course, yeah, everything can be solved. We are engineers. Everything can be solved. But it's slightly less efficient. And if you multiply that, you, you know, we're in the content space now. So it's not just numbers. It's uh, you know, by the time you start dividing things just in natural languages. You know, maybe you're interested in exactly the same thing that I am interested in. Right? Maybe. Just hypothesizing. But you're interested in receiving information in Russian. And I'm interested in receiving that information in Italian. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, why can't we have an XML protocol just to specify all the inputs and to specify? It's not a matter of protocol. It's a matter of the combinatorial explosion of addresses. No, uh, Just think of the variables. You know, let's say there's a bunch of topics, there's a bunch of preferences, a bunch of languages. Okay, so you have to multiply all the topics times all the languages times all the preferences. Is that reasonable? And if if this is reasonable, if your conclusion is, oh yeah, we have 128 bits in the like DB6 addresses, we can have plenty of time, excuse me, a space to encode that thing. Sure. Do you have enough memory and routers to really deal with that amount of space? No. Uh, if if the, the technique is, oh, we'll use IP multicast. IP multicast already has issues for what it is. Uh, so you're now proposing to use that same infrastructure for things that it wasn't designed to do. Even though the things that it is designed to do, you know, maybe cannot do that uh, too well. The point I'm making is, Content, you know, shifting to the perspective of uh, looking at content requires different tools. It may not require different tools all the time. But I think in my research, I want to look at uh, a good solution, a real solution, a new solution for that. When you say tools, you mean, um, you mean hardware, you mean uh, routing algorithms? Both. Yeah, all of the above. Yeah, well, you know, that's all what this presentation is about. Routing algorithms, all the, everything. Security, everything. So, uh, why can't we just uh, invent, uh, okay, we have no more. Uh, you need to subscribe something. Well, hold it, because the whole presentation is about this. So you can save all the questions for, <laughs> the specific questions for when I'm going to talk about routing, Forwarding, security, everything. You got a question? Uh, this question is on the answer, but we want to clarify your point. So, yes. uh, if, what if you see the public subscribe service as from the level of content, or you see it from the point of IP, multicasting, and folders? Mm. So, I see a lot of, on the internet, I see a lot of information about micro format comments. My small base technologies, uh, which describe content on web. Let's say again, what's the what format? Micro for formats, for example. So, both technologies are used in internet of uh, our, our internet area, which describe content. So, I don't think this presentation about this level of construction, or are you talking about packets and transmission? No, no. Uh, maybe you should give it some examples. Okay. So, uh, let, let me define it formally, and then I'll give you some examples and go back to your question. Okay? You give me two minutes. This is essentially at a high level what happens. Instead of assigning addresses, by the way, it was the network that was assigning addresses. Now, uh, the applications decide what they want. So, they tell the network, I'm interested in things that match predicate P and predicate Q. Or predicate Q. This thing is interested in P, this is interested in Q. So when something publishes, it publishes a message, the network matches, says, oh, it matches P and Q. So where is this message going to go? Three and two. Three and two. Uh, two only, uh, according Three to the slide. Three and two, because it matches P and Q. 
Uh, no, 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 I'm sorry. Matches only P. Oh, yeah, I didn't even read my own slide. Yeah, yes, it goes over there, right? So this is the, what's P, then you ask? What's M? Okay, we'll, we'll get to that. Sorry. Uh, May you? Yeah. Uh, when uh, you say publish, in fact, what you do is you send the packet. Yes, pretty much. Okay. Uh, at the moment of publishing, uh, yeah. if the packet in IP terms, yeah. you can <coughs> multicast. None of the above. It's whatever. It's whatever match. So my, my goal, nowhere. It might go to zero destinations because nobody is interested. So, you know, if I said uh, this packet is about the University of Uganda, nobody's interested. Okay. Uh, and if you know that uh, two points are interested because you sent a uh, JD uh, query or something. You just know. So you send a uh, unique packet. No, 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 no. You're getting your. You know, no. Scratch where you have in your mind and try to think in those terms. I don't care how you implement it. That's the whole point of what I'm discussing. I'm giving you the service perspective. This gray area, you can use multicast, you can use, uh, you know, a pigeon that you <laughs> send out or something and it flies to the destination because the pigeon knows. Uh, or whatever the technology might be underneath. I don't care. Broadcast. You know, write things on the wall, whatever you want. The problem is, I want to send this to whoever is interested. The network does it. How? We'll see. Okay, so if it does it, underneath, they might use IP multicast if it finds that it's useful or something else. That's, that's the whole point of it. Yes. Does network decide itself uh, which uh, things the packet? Uh, match about, or no. packet has some mapping no the information is in the packet it's the content of the packet of course in order for the network to understand it you have to write in something that the network understands but you can think of that that's easy okay? you know write it in, in English or you know, in, uh, whatever it doesn't, doesn't matter so what's the problem with current technology I mean suppose we have number of uh, so, service uh, leave uh, some smart application installed uh, and uh, if someone uh, needs to publish an information mm -hmm. he already knows uh, this service uh, it, they uh, IPs are built in uh, for example um, uh, browsers or mail clients so they uh, he, he, or live journal um, and, and yeah, so on <laughs> <laughs> so uh, then he publishes. Uh, then he publishes uh, this information. Uh, these service servers uh, already know uh, and what? receive. Uh, the they know who is interested. Uh, yeah. uh, I'm looking at uh, send this part at first. Okay. Uh, so uh, someone sends this information and yeah. uh, service uh, get servers get this information. Yes. And also, uh, the same way, uh, there are, uh, there are um, s subscribers and they know uh, these servers. Yes. And uh, then and information... They subscribe to the servers. Yeah, the specific yeah, servers that they know will receive publications of that topic. These uh, servers will receive publications and uh, using some smart uh, algorithms uh, yeah. decide uh, if uh, yeah. uh, someone is interested in that yeah. information or no and yeah. after that they will yeah. send. So Absolutely, that's exactly it. Yes. So yeah. uh, it will work based on uh, IPv4 or, yeah. I don't, it's or not, maybe this UDP. Is not, yeah, maybe you're... Uh, Maybe I'm not making myself clear. I'm not proposing to change IPv4, or I'm not proposing to invent uh, IPv7. Uh, I really am not. Uh, in so, so fact, so what's the goal? What's okay? If you, let me get through the first five slides. Maybe they'll be clear. <laughs> but the point is, however you do this, the way that you proposed is a centralized scheme, which might be fine. Everybody publishes to one server. Everybody subscribe to one server. And this server, I don't know, where do you want to put it? Here in St. Petersburg? Google, for example. Google, Google, Google. Google. sure. Yeah. You know, Mountain View, California. Google yeah. Reader, something like that. Yeah, 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 something like that, exactly. So, you publish to Google, 
and you subscribe to Google. And Google is, does everything, because Google <laughs> solves every place problem. And uh, it matches everybody's interest against everybody's. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, and then it stands out. You know, if you are subscribed, he is subscribed. Yeah. Say, if 20 people in this room are subscribed, we all get a copy of the new you know, announcement that I sent out, for example. Yeah. Yeah, it's doable. What are the drawbacks? Well, okay, one, you should see yourself from this example. Google is in Mountain View, California. Uh, if, let's say, half of the people here are interested in, uh, I don't know, is there a soccer team in St. Petersburg? Yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't study that, I should have. Um, what's the soccer team in St. Petersburg? <laughs> Okay, and everybody is, how many people are interested in soccer here? Okay, let's say there's 10 people at least. Okay, if you all subscribe, and then let's say the, the team uh, newsletter comes out, or some radio station with commentators talking about the last match, you know, last week or something, they all publish to Google, and then Google sends everybody to here. Do you see a problem? Google has uh, office here and servers as well. <laughs> well, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. We we still we're still in the model where everybody goes to the same place. Yes. Okay. 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 And wait, and we said say please send us the information about our soccer team so that Google sends us sends us a packet. Yes. It is uh, replicated on our side in some pieces. Okay, great. Uh, so now you're coming to that problem. How do you know it needs to be replicated? Uh, I mean, I have two guys to, uh, to send two, and yeah. they are located on two different physical interfaces. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're coming to the same problems that I'm coming to. I know all those problems. I, I <laughs> say that, you know, it's just, you know, think about those, put them on the scale of the internet, and then you'll figure that, you know, maybe there are some problems. That's yeah. a problem matching, for example. So, how many interests uh, can you think you have on the internet? If you look at, uh, maybe roughly speaking, you can classify my interest by looking at my the pages that I browse on the internet. You know, so there's a few pages. I don't know. There's, there's one page that I always go to get my news. I don't have a TV. I admit, I don't have a TV. So I get my news from uh, this thing called democracynow.org, which is a uh, news program in the U.S. Uh, and other things, sort of Publica, which is a newspaper, an Italian newspaper, and other things. So I maybe have four or five sites that I visit on a regular basis. In addition to that, I have specific information that I'm interested in. You know, I'm interested in computer networking. I'm interested in you know research. I'm interested in airplanes and, and many other things. So let's say, let's say, just for the sake of argument, that I have. 20 to 50 things that I can write down and say I'm interested in A, B, C and characterize them, okay, as content. Okay. How many users are there on the internet? <laughs> Roughly, I don't know. Roughly a billion. Huh? Roughly a billion. Roughly a billion. Okay. And you know, as soon as a billion Chinese turn on their cell phones, it's going to be <laughs> <laughs> but uh, let's say it roughly a billion. So you have a billion users with their 50 preferences, and you know how many sources of information do you have? You know, maybe less than that, right? You don't have, and certainly the popularity. So you can say there's some that are very popular, some that are not. But, you know, let's say there are some thousands of those things. So you know, let's say they produce a message every I don't know, minute. Maybe. So you have a thousand messages produced every minute, and you have a billion uh, people times 50 uh, of those preferences. So, you know, for a, a thousand every minute, it means roughly, let's say, 20 per second. No. Um, yeah, 20 per second. So every, uh, um, whatever, 50 milliseconds, you have to match this thing against 50 billion preferences. Okay. And you know, Google's big. Yeah, Google's big. They can deal with that maybe, maybe, I doubt it. But, uh, uh, you know, as soon as you tell somebody at Google to do that, they will say, no, I can't do it with a simple centralized scheme. I have to do it with a network. And that's why we've been talking about content based networking. 
I mean, the point is, I know that conceptually, it's simple. You subscribe, somebody publishes, you match, he delivers. I mean, as easy as that, yes. But the point is, if you architect this for scalability, it has to be a network. And so as soon as you make it a network, you run into routing problems. You run into forwarding problems. You know, you have to figure out routing algorithms, forwarding algorithms, and all those things. That's what I'm studying. Is that a question? Just, just to make it clear for me. Yeah. Uh, all this is a matter of interactivity. We uh, don't want to wait for Google, for Google to match. And Absolutely. This is the problem. Not only interactivity, so latency, but also throughput. <laughs> uh, I really, in the examples, I hope you noticed this, I was extremely conservative. You really, you really think that Google has, uh, make it the pages. Do you have an idea how many pages are indexed by Google? It's not a thousand. I don't know, but I'm sure it's in the millions. Okay. So, and you can think of them as they're, you know, changing with different degrees. It's not true that every page you know, indexed by Google changes every day. You know, Google indexes my web page. My web page, you know, changes. I don't know. I, don't know. I mean, I, yeah, some of my let's say. Any one of my pages, the many pages that I maintain, my courses, you know, the stuff that I have for my students, my papers and stuff, maybe will change, uh, you know, twice a week. Okay, but that's me, that's one little loser guy like me that doesn't change it. These days, you have, I don't know what people do with their time, you know, blogs, Twitter, you know what this thing is? Yeah. <laughs> you go to the bathroom and you know, post the world. <laughs> I'm being right now, just so you know. <laughs> you know that happens. That's what they do. So in, in a space like that, you, know, you really have a lot of resources posting potentially a lot of useless information, but nonetheless, a lot of information, then the centralized architecture just falls apart. Yes. Uh, as far as I understand, you want to make do something like delicious. Uh, it's, it's related to that. It's not exactly that. Uh, maybe I don't understand enough of delicious, uh, what Delicious does. But Delicious is based on the same idea of telling the system what you like. So when you click on, I'm really not a nice, I'm a backwards guy. I don't know if you realize this, but I was born before 19. <laughs> <laughs> After World War II. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm a little uh, old-fashioned in the sense that I don't use a lot of new technologies. In fact, I like to make fun of them without knowing what they are. Yeah, what a good person as usual. But, uh, no, the, the, those technologies, as far as I understand, allow you to tag documents in the sense of telling... You tell the system what you like by tagging the documents you read, and by telling the system the documents that you like in terms of tags, right? Did I sort of say it in a confusing enough way? Um, that's absolutely related to what I'm talking about. But Delicious doesn't exactly do the routing for you, right? Um, something like, so you can choose tags, and you can choose information with this tag. Yeah. So, Something like. Yeah, as I said, it's really related to that. Oh, I'm also uh, I'm also not an application kind of guy. I don't study that as much. Uh, what I like to study are the routing protocols that are behind the application. So, in fact, by the way, after all this, a little bit of skepticism, <laughs> I started talking about these things about ten years ago. Okay, I got my PhD and um, I wrote my dissertation and at the end of uh, 98, so about exactly 10 years ago, I graduated in 99. And it had essentially those ideas in it. And if you read it, it pretty much says, and, you know, I don't remember, but it, sort of paraphrasing myself, um, you know, I envision you know, applications where you tell the system what you like and the system finds information of interest for you and, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and okay, 
fine. I'm not going to say anything more about the application. I'm going to study the routing protocols that, that do that. And I ended up studying the routing protocols that do that. And I still think that it's a valid idea. And whoever comes up with the beautiful applications, you know, delicious, this, Facebook, that, uh, it's fine by me. I'm really happy. In fact, I think that vision is still pretty much valid. If you look at the internet, actually you are touching on an area that I was looking at recently. Um, uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention was one of the problems is experimenting. Once you, let's say you come up with a protocol, a forwarding algorithm or a running protocol. Uh, how do you test it? How do you see that it's fast enough? Well, you need workloads. Uh, how do you get workloads uh, right now? Well, go to Delicious. You go to Delicious, see how many people like what, how many documents exist with those tags, and match them up. And in fact, I was in the process of writing a proposal to to use the data. The data that you get from Delicious is publicly available, by the way. So you can download uh, all of the all the tabs and all the documents and what people like, um, and you can use that. And so the idea was to use that data to produce workloads for a system like my routing industry. Okay, um, so that's great actually. That's great. So I don't need to go into this because you already know it's applications. Uh, these are the boring things. And this, you know, multiplayer games, distributed. Actually, none of this news distribution. Uh, again, by the way, I was listing these things. You know, I would say maybe ten years ago, but pretty much, yeah, it's the same list that I've been trying to. Convince people that. Uh, so I talked about messages and predicates. So let me spend two words on it, but you all understand. If you understand the, the whole delicious thing, keep that in mind and don't even try to get into this. But essentially, you can view a message as a, a set of attributes that have names and values, and a preference as essentially a Boolean expression that says, I'm interested in this or that, and that and that. And so, on. so this is intended to represent. Uh, Say uh, traffic congestion with a J, which is this, this is wrong. In English is congestion with a G. Uh, accident is spelled right. Uh, you know, and uh, it's it's intended to exemplify a traffic uh, notification system. Again, think of this. Can you do this with Google? Maybe you can, but maybe not. You know, every car on the highway uh, tells Google in Mountain View, California that uh, there's a congestion or that they're interested in, you know, now I'm getting onto, I don't know the highways here, so I'm going to give an example. In Italy, there's a big highway that goes north to south in Italy, it's called A1, and Autostrada del Sole uh, also, and you get onto A1 and, you know, get into congestion, it's A1. Uh, so you want to know traffic uh, information. What traffic information? Well, I'm going you know, through some kilometers, some kilometers, in the north direction. So if the traffic is on the northbound, and I'm on the southbound, I don't care about it. Okay? Try encoding that in IPv6 addresses. Uh, and, oh, yes, and I want to know about uh, everything. So this is all information that you can figure out uh, from a message. Uh, this, uh, this might be my, my expressions of interest. I'm routing, I'm going, uh, driving um, on a one direction south, so I'm interested in that. I'm interested in any accident uh, alert. I'm also interested in weather information. And I'm interested in sports, you know, you know driving my car and listening to the radio, you know, and anything comes up uh, about AC Milan. Let me know. <laughs> okay, so those are messages, those are predicates. But again, you can view messages and predicates as delicious sets of tags. Okay. And the idea is this. The idea, actually, forget those last two parts. The idea is really this. All that I'm trying to sell you, <coughs> what I'm trying to sell to the research community for a while, is that I want to do all of all the things that I said uh, in a network style, meaning with the distributed architecture, with routers, they do these things fast, they have routing algorithms, they have forwarding algorithms. Uh, so I want to do the same thing that Google would do with a big ass mountains of servers somewhere, or maybe a distributed, you know, Google, they're smart. You know. 
So they have server farms and they know how to do things that are replicated and, and super efficient. I want to do that, but I want to do it on the network, not just Google. Uh, I want this to be something that you deploy. Also, yeah. uh, it seems to me that uh, some important <coughs> important um, information is missed uh, in the text, uh, namely. Actually, I'm not only interested in some particular information, but I'm uh, extremely interested in uh, source of information. For example, Bloomberg or some other uh, good ag agency uh, is yeah. suitable for me, but uh, for example, some around. yellow press is... Yeah. Really okay, yeah, you can encode that. You can encode all of that. You can say, I'm interested in, um, you know, sports uh, news from Gazzetta dello Sport which is one of the Italian uh, newspaper uh, that deals about sport, that, you know, with sports, but not this other one, not Korea dello Sport. Uh, I, I want to know financial information from, uh, you tell me, MSNBC or Bloomberg as opposed to, I don't know what, uh, you know? Uh, yes, you can encode all of that. If that information is available in the content, and it is, because typically it would say, you know, issuer of information is Bloomberg, uh, and, you know, they might even have a digital signature for that message. Uh, so you can encode all of that. And again... It really does matter in Rotten, for example. It matters everywhere, yeah, I'm sure. Or maybe, you know what, you maybe can, you can even uh, think of having a list of preferences. So I want to give this uh, predicate, so the match is say Bloomberg, just for the sake of example, highest priority. And I want this other one to be delivered with lower priority. Okay. So you can even think of doing that. Uh, so I hope that this uh, idea will, th this idea will convince, or this slide will convince you that it's not just an issue of matching. But it's really a networking problem. Uh, so I was trying to exemplify this by showing you that it's not that you send everything to Mountain View, California, and stuff comes back to you. And even if you did send everything to Mountain View, California, Google, as I said, they're smart. They would deal with that like this, as you were suggesting. They would put a server right here. So if you're in St. Petersburg, that's exactly where they would put the local server that is with your subscriptions. You know, if I'm in Lugano, well, in Lugano there would be another server that deals with that, with myself. And then, but then what happens if they did that? They would have a network like this. So somebody is publishing, let's say Bloomberg in New York. We have East and West. You know, the other way around, right? okay. say. You know, goes around the world, Japan. You know. uh, so somebody in New York produces this information, and two people are interested in it. You know, somebody in St. Petersburg and somebody in Lugano. Okay. How does the system route the information, route the information from New York to those two places? Based on what? Exactly how does the routing infrastructure spread routing information? So those are all the research questions that I'm asking. We're saying, give me a routing protocol. Give me a, a network architecture. Give me the network protocols to do this. And sure, underneath, it's going to be AP. No question about that. So that's not the question. The question is, how do I do the routing for content? So, do you have any ideas? It depends, it depends on, on goal of our road and, and uh, of our criteria. So if we need speed, uh, well, the idea is, is yeah, one speed. Uh, if we need, uh, you don't want another to duplicate traffic unnecessarily. See, uh, if you have a router, yes. uh, that smart router, which uh, can um, analyze that payload of the payloads. Yeah, yeah, that's it's the not a problem. It's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, I mean you have it. I'm giving it to you. Every one of these uh, boxes, uh, bubbles here. Every one of these things that have numbers is one of those smart things. Yeah. So now I'm asking you. Okay. You can figure those things. They are smart, so you can tell them what to do. So uh, the the PMQ asks uh, some kind of 
join, uh, and they ask uh, uh, they ask for a particular type of information. Yeah. So uh, the packet tenters uh, and uh, as uh, all hosts on the network know well, who is interested in what everywhere. So this guy over here knows that there's some guy in St. Petersburg that wants Q, P, and some guy in Uganda that wants Q. Uh, is that your proposal? It's a valid one. I'm not saying it, 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 it works, definitely. Alright, okay, so they, they know about you and they know about me. How do they decide where to send it? They also know that I am at this IP address, so they send a copy to here and a copy to there. Mm -hmm. First of all, they can use normal routing protocols. Like, uh, I mean, just uh, send two packets and one to P, uh, uh, nine server, and one to. Uh, oh, okay, but now we're back in the centralized world, where yeah, yeah. now everything is centralized in every router. So every router is a centralized router that knows all the subscriptions of the world. Uh, and well, uh, <laughs> even with single system, a uh, single subscription scheme uh, with uh, tickets, uh, market data, options, it's already a headache. Yeah. Well, that, okay, I have a better idea. What do you think about using something like something based main name systems? So, DNS work hierarchically, so we can yeah. use something like that for one. Yeah, absolutely. There's some systems that have been proposed that are hierarchical in nature. <laughs> Keep in mind that DNS works that way for a very good reason. Do you know why? No, 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 no. I, I understand the motivation. No, I'm asking why can it work that way? Why can you answer DNS queries with a hierarchical system? Have you thought about it? Because the domains have uh, Because the domains are hierarchical. So if you ask yeah. where www.inf.unisi.ch is, uh -huh. chances are that that's going to be somewhere in the inf.unisi.ch, which is going to be in, in, in unisi.ch, which is going to be in ch. So the nature of the queries is already hierarchical. So it will have uh, a nature of the uh, that <laughs> it make subjects. Absolutely. If you did that, then yes. But we already give you examples, plenty of examples, where those things are not hierarchical. When you have things that overlap, again, I'm forgetting the team, uh, the name of the <laughs> soccer team here, but the soccer team here could be discussed in, let's say, a St. Petersburg newspaper, in a, Saint, in a newspaper published in Moscow, in a newspaper published in Rome, in uh, anywhere you like, in some German television, in... Uh, you know, it's not that... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. Yes? No? Yeah. Exactly. You exactly. want to play German television. Why? Because you play some German team? Yeah, this they whole play play is play 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 play. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, man. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Alright, so, okay, so that's a good example. It's, again, you know, and you can generalize this to so many things. Uh, think of just a few applications, um, uh, you know, traffic applications. Traffic information is, is typical of that. You have traffic applications in St. Petersburg that might affect local drivers, the bus drivers, you know, those things, or people that are, you know, long you know, haul drivers, truck drivers that want to go by St. Petersburg. Uh, but they are also interested in other things. So again, DNS works because it is itself hierarchical. And so the queries match the hierarchical structure of the network. Okay. Uh, how? Uh, why Google search works? I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Google search. Yeah. So uh, the fact is that Google has lots of servers all, all over the world. Yeah. 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 And the point is that they somehow propagate uh, their indexes. Yeah. Sure. Sure. So how do they do this? It's easy, the same way that CNN does it. You know, when you go to www.cnn.com, you don't go to this one machine. And even if you did go to the one machine, there's <coughs> machines in, in the fabric of the network. There's this company called Akamai that caches the content for you. So you think you're going to CNN or whatever your favorite product. 
There's no always there. There's no glass mustard about that. So if you go to that, you think that you're going to that, but in fact, there's something in the middle of the network that is already sending you the answers. Yes. So right. How do they do that? They pre-cache that stuff out to the network. So they have, as you said, they have these big indexes, or CNN has their main page. So whenever they change their main page, they deploy the main page out to the caching system so that whenever somebody wants to go to them, they don't reach the central server, but they hit the cache before. Why can you do that? Yeah, because you are CNN. Because you have a zillion users all over the place, because you're Google. Okay? You, you know, with your blog posts, do not do that. Okay, so maybe you do. But I don't, <laughs> uh, I don't have a blog. As well as discussing the system where the Google have handle all the stuff. I publish it on Google. Yes. And after that, Google. Uh, oh, with the same techniques. Yeah, sure. Now and now Google becomes the center of. As we said, I agree with you. There is an architecture that works perfectly. The centralized architecture. Okay. So give it to Google and ask question Google to Google. I mean, okay. Google somehow will propagate it to all. Yeah, but I. Okay. Let me let me write the conclusion on that. Google <laughs> everything <laughs> rules. <laughs> the thing is, I am asking a question about Google. If you, if that's your view, I accept that view. I'm happy with this view. But I'm just saying, okay, now it's not about me. It's about Google. What's the first question you ask to a Google engineer? Or what they would ask to you or to me? Okay, the question would be, how in the world would I make this thing a distributed system? Google, as I said, they're not stupid. They know very well. They think in order to scale, they need to have a lot of machines. Okay? In order to have a lot of machines, you have mechanisms. You have to have mechanisms that replicate the information from is the central machine to the many machines, so that you look at a set of machines as if they were one. Okay, you have to have a replication scheme of some sort. So you call Fernando, and Fernando tells you that you need Paxos to do consistency and all this. Now that's for just a database. Now you have a content-based publish subscribe system in the Google. You know, Google pops up. Okay, go to popsub.google.com, and that's what you get, and you can subscribe, and you can publish. Well, now Google has to push this thing out. Google has to have a server here in St. Petersburg. It has to have a server in Ghana. It has to have a server in New York City. And guess what? They're going to end up with exactly the same problem. It's going to be called Google Content-Based Networking, <laughs> but, and Google rules, I mean, keep that in mind, but it's exactly the same problem. So, what I'm telling you is, I'm not saying that these things are not possible in, you know, this is not the, um, you know, P versus NP. It's not that we don't know the answer. Uh, we know the answer. Uh, it's, the issue is, we don't know how to engineer it in a way that it's scalable, that it can be deployed and effectively done or not. And so, again, my question is still here. So, you have Bloomberg Publishing in New York. Uh, I'm interested in it in Lugano, and somebody else is interested in it. Uh, you is interested in it in, uh, in St. Petersburg. You tell me, how does it work? Three to five, huh? From three to two to five. <laughs> yeah, I have that in the next slide. Don't worry. About that. <laughs> I can put you short as fast in my head. But uh, no, the problem is. As th these are just the, the connections, right? So, as is, three doesn't know that there's that guy out in St. Petersburg and this guy down in Lugano. You know, three doesn't know. So three has to know. And if you want to go three, two, five, then two has to know, and five has to know. Okay, this, this is routing. Yeah. yeah. So how do you do it? Okay, so one idea is 
to do it with these routing tables. Excuse me, went too far. Routing tables. So now the the, the black, dark, uh, the dark arrows represent routing information. So it says, oh, I know at three that somebody at two is interested in predicates of some sort. Okay. And so five, for example, has these entries. It says, oh, my interface to router nine is associated with predicate P. My interface to router seven is associated with predicate Q. So here you go. Notice that this is exactly like a forwarding table for IP uh, routers. Okay, if you take instead of Q and P, you put addresses, or better yet, uh, address prefixes. You know, subnet addresses. That's exactly what you get, right? So now we have all these tables. Uh, now we're getting to it. Now, how do we go from three? Well, it's easy. Somebody sends at three, and uh, there's, you know, there's something else we need to do. We need to in identify the broadcast tree of the sender. So that's that's what the, these things are. This is the broadcast tree, and then we we traverse the broadcast tree following the black arrows, and here we go. 3 sends to 2, 2 sends to 5, 5 splits because it finds two branches of the broadcast tree that have black arrows. Great, so it goes this way. See, this is a branch of the broadcast tree that doesn't have any black arrow. So we don't go that way. Okay. So 5 makes that decision. Send it to 7, we're done. Send it to 8, we're done. We're done. We're done. Okay, so this, this is one proposal. Okay. Does it work? Mm. No. The well, problem no. is we wrote in tables. Huh? There is a problem in wrote in tables, it seems, because the, what kind of we problem? have a huge amount of predicates and... Yes, and exactly. That yes, is not exactly correct. Right. Correct. Exactly. Correct. exactly. What do you put in those writing tables? In fact, I studied these things, and this, this, uh, this is a high-level view of a routing protocol that I studied and uh, published in 2004 that has exactly this, these problems and tries to solve the problem of what you put in the routing tables. And uh, so just before I get to that and want to get to that, let me just mention a few of the research questions. If you have ideas, happy to discuss them because I'm actively talk, you know, studying these things. Now, you understood the whole point, right? Of trying to base the communication on the content. But, base the communication on the content has a fundamental issue. That is, if we speak a slightly different language, and here, obviously, the, the clear example is, well, you guys speak Russian, I speak Italian. How do we communicate? <laughs> in English, good idea. But, in English, somebody says, Football, somebody says soccer, right? So even in English, the same concept can be referred to in different ways. Okay, so maybe you can say, when I subscribe, I subscribe for both. Okay, that's a good idea. But again, you know, it's not never clear, because again, then you have to structure information in a specific way. So, to me, there's still an issue, and I'm just raising issues, I'm not giving precise answers, I'm just raising something that could be problematic in, in thinking about these, uh, a network like this. Uh, so, a content-based network where the addresses are the content of the information, well, if you don't give it a structure, then you're never going to meet in the middle. The sender and the receiver have to meet in the middle based on the content. Somebody has to publish something that corresponds to whatever the subscriber wanted. Otherwise, they won't talk. So you have that problem. Another problem is um, just in the design of the network, you want to have autonomous systems. You want to have network operators or maybe an institution. Say this institution that has its own local network and wants to either Protect it from information from the outside. Protect it from leaking information from the inside to the outside. 
or maybe just defining information that is allowed to go out or not allowed to come in, or vice versa. So you have routing policies. Now, how do you do that? Well, again, you do that in, in the internet through some protocols, for example, uh, the BGP protocol defines who can carry traffic for whoever, you know, it's very complicated. And you have similar situations in the content space. Another issue, this is one of the ones that I've been studying recently, it's very, very interesting, very intriguing, maybe I'll have the time, maybe not, to talk about it in, uh, in you know, this presentation. What is the theoretical basis for content-based networking? We sort of know, there's a lot of studies on lower bounds uh, for the complexity of routing, especially lower bounds of routing compared to the accuracy of routing. So the, there's these studies of compact routing that tell you how much you can stretch the minimal uh, distances, you know, forwarding distances, at the expense of how much memory you have to install in routers. I'm interested in those things too. How much memory do you need? What's the space complexity of routing in content-based networks? Uh, I studied that and I have some good ideas if you want to talk to me. Um, obviously, you know, the, most, the hardest things here are lower bounds. Who knows? Uh, lower bounds, you never know. You know, they're tough to, to figure out. Um, then this is what we've been talking about so far. Routing. How do you do it? I published, um, I would say, six or seven different routing schemes already. I'm not convinced anyone is the optimal one. I, have, I think I have a pretty good idea how routing should be done based on content, but I'm not so sure. And I think it's still a very much an open, an open problem. Uh, so, again, uh, it's not just... <coughs> It's not just the specifics of the routing protocol, okay? It's not the format of the messages. It's how you actually install routing information all over the network. Not easy. Now, uh, this is something we've talked about before. How do you evaluate a system like that? You need workloads. Uh, what are the workloads? Well, you can extract workloads from applications. What are the applications? Well, delicious. Maybe. Maybe there's some uh, there's some, some systems already that provide that some. Well, I'm sure this is true in, in, in Russia as well. Some Italian uh, phone operators offer uh, alerts uh, on sport events, so you can get uh, messages on your cell phone. Uh, you know that your favorite team is losing three to one or something. <laughs> Send me an SMS only when it gets to really, really bad scores. <laughs> um, so you can effectively subscribe or something. So, what are the type of applications? What are the what's the data? You know, do we have different subscriptions? Maybe they all have the same subscription. At that point, yes, use IPv6 uh, with multicast. That's fine. If that were the case, yes, use it. Um, let's see what's another. One? Oh, yeah, this is another interesting one. This is a very tough one. Uh, security. How do you preserve the privacy of data? Well, uh, well can't you just encrypt it? If I ask a question sounding you know, smart, the answer is typically no. <laughs> uh, can, you, can you encrypt the data again? Mm, we can. Encrypt it, then how can you match this? We can. We have a nice company in <coughs> Sweden with uh, sold, <coughs> with, uh, with sales the uh, encrypted channel to them, <coughs> and you can open a, <coughs> a tunnel to them, mm -hmm. and from, from there you can subscribe to anything. And uh, Sweden law oh, pr 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 uh, uh, pr protects. So it's like a Tor network when you just uh, uh, defend the proxy. Yeah. Uh, the problem is with Tor, uh, as we know from news, uh, is that Tor itself is not encrypted. It only hides your 
uh, IP address, but right. it, it, it lives uh, over track and encrypted, so uh, anyone who cares to uh, scan the Tor traffic would count for it. Uh, okay, for let me, let me uh, okay, make this everything. problem a little more defined. Um, do you have to trust this anonymizer? Yeah, you, yeah. Uh, you must. Of course, then, okay, so then you have to trust this one person. I want to do it without trusting anybody. <laughs> I want to tell the network what I want so that the network can match my interest against the information published on the net. But I don't want the network to understand what I want. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so what the hell do I want? <laughs> no, if I want that. I mean, think of this. This is, in fact, this... You know, um, there's cryptographic solutions for this, by the way. Yeah. Uh, they're hard in, in counts. Yes, that's true. They're very hard. In fact, that's exactly the point. Uh, they're not efficient. Uh, think of, um, I don't know, I'm sure that everybody, Google rules now. Look <laughs> at this. Everybody has a Gmail account here, right? Right, I don't. But everybody <laughs> does, because I'm an old as I said, I was born. Uh, and uh, so you leave all your mail messages on Google, right? Uh, so Google knows who you are. <laughs> they know. Uh, I would like to have a system where my mail is is on the web, but I don't want Google to know who I am and who I write to and what I write and what I look for. I also want to search that information. You know, it's easy enough to to have the information over there. But if you want Google to search that information, to give you, you know, email messages where you wrote, uh, you know, whatever, St. Petersburg. Okay, give me all my messages that contain the word St. Petersburg. I want the information to be there. I want Google to do the searches for me, but I don't want Google to see the messages. That's, that's a pretty tough requirement. Huh? There are some cryptographic techniques to do that, and they're pretty, pretty good, pretty smart. Uh, but again, many of them are not suitable for this, and we'll see. I mean, we're still studying this thing. It might be, it might work, it might not work. Again, this is something that I now have essentially 10 minutes, but uh, I have a whole presentation, and one, this one is one of the arguments that I have, not the topics. And there's many other things that I'm interested in, not really too interested in, you know, how you integrate this with applications. There's a whole software engineering aspect, so I'm less interested in that. Okay, so. This is the menu. I had, you thought this was the whole business, this was just the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> we spent the entire hour and a half on the introduction. So I have, I had prepared actually four presentations. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Uh, one is on a concrete routing protocol. This is the protocol that I mentioned, uh, published in 2004. I also developed a concrete uh, forwarding algorithm uh, that I also developed myself. Uh, I mean, the, the code is on the web and downloaded. That's, that's an interesting algorithm, very fast. Did the analysis, published in 2003. Uh, I've, I've been doing a lot of work recently on the theory of content based routing, how you model the network, how you compute lower bounds. Well, no, how you compute complexity bounds, not lower bounds. Those are tough, tough to find. And security also, how to do that. And so, what I wanted to do actually, I didn't want to go through all of them, because that's impossible, but I wanted to let you choose which one you're most interested in, and then I can go through it. And now I'm like, the watch says that we have 10 minutes. <laughs> so, uh, let's. Half an hour. Again, I'm going, this is going to be the, the tape of the 30s, you know, slowing it down. It's not possible. Five, ten minutes Okay, let's. Let's do 10 to 15 minutes. You choose. Okay, so who wants to hear about the specific part of the protocol, forwarding algorithm, the theory part, or security? Uh, let's vote. <laughs> who votes for a concrete model for the Six. Six? Six. Okay, six. This. One, two, three, four. Man. 
Let's start. Should we do the uh, health security content based round? How long Who said that? Oh man, that's a good one. Uh, Alright, uh, right, let me click on the theory. Actually, no, the theory is security. Let's do a, a runoff. Uh, security and theory. Security. Do you want security? One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> Try to actually go in sequence. Okay, so let me just go real quick. I'm not. Um, okay, let me just go real quick. Here. Okay, you know the problem, state of the art. Like, so, what is theory about? So, now that I already told you, you need to come up with a model. And then you have to come up with analysis. Okay, and then you take the model and see what you can find out of the model. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you a model of the system, and then we'll maybe pick a few concrete algorithms and look at them, or see what we can do. Uh, now, if I already uh, presented, the model is going to be intuitive. It's, it's, uh, it's easy. Okay, so you start with a model. Typically, a model of the network is a graph. A graph that is weighted, because you're interested in counting you know, costs, in addition to the graph, you have these three things. M is the universe of messages, P is the universe of predicates, and pred is the predicate function that associates a, a predicate to every, um, to every node here, right? So these are all the allowable messages, P is the allowable predicates. Predicates are function, Boolean functions, essentially, they define sets of messages. And the pred function is what associates every vertex to a predicate. Okay? Easy enough. Uh, and then we have a model of routing. And the model of routing is an extension of a normal model. Uh, the syntax of things, we have packages, packets, I'm sorry, and packets carry a message and a header. Okay? And again, those are messages out of M and headers out of a header space. And there's hop by hop forward. So at every hop, every router implements these three functions. There are three router and local functions. So there are functions that are implemented by every single router. Collectively, those functions have to do the right thing. Collectively. So if you remember, you know, three was sending to two, was sending to five, was sending to seven. Okay. But Two is deciding locally, just like an internet router looks up the routing tables. Okay? What are these functions? There's three functions. The first one is the end function that takes a message and produces an initial header. Okay? Then there's the header rewriting function. You can view this in IP as the one that says, takes the TTL and subtracts one and puts the new TTL in the header. Okay? You can think of this as doing a lot more than just the TTL. If you are, say, annotating things, and, okay, I take this destination set, I know that I sent it this way to this destination set, then you can split and put on two destination sets. So, the header function is what produces a new header out of the previous header of the message. And then there's the most important function, which is the forwarding function, that takes the message, the header, and then it decides where to send it to the neighbors, okay? This is every router implementing the init function, the header rewriting function, and the um, forwarding function. Hmm? This is it. This is the formalism. This is the syntax of the system. Obviously, you have to instantiate those functions. Okay. You have to tell me, you know, router x has this function. This function fwd sub v is the forwarding function of router v, vertex v in the graph. Okay, so how do you do these things? Well, there's many schemes that you can think of. And this is an example, an idea of a scheme. I'll explain this. The scheme here uh, is what we call a per-source forwarding scheme. 
that maintains a spanning tree rooter, rooted at every source, and it maintains a forwarding function based on what's called the uh, you know this table that associates the source, the next hop to a predicate. So in this particular example, we're looking at router six. Okay, this is the a fragment of the table of router six. How does it work? Well, router 6 receives a message. The message header tells it that the message was originated at router 1. And so 6 looks up the table and says, oh, if this is 1 that originated this, and you're sending it to, you can try to send it to router 1, to router 9, to router 7, and to router 2, right? And you will be sending things to router 1, Nothing. To router 9, nothing. To router 7, the things that match this predicate. To router 2, the things that match this predicate. Okay. What is this predicate? Well, this predicate is the disjunctures of all the predicates that are downstream on the branch from router 6 down to router 2. This is intuitive. You want to reach through router 2 all the routers that are downstream on the spanning tree rooted at 1. Who are they? What are the routers that are downstream from 6 on the branch that goes to 2? What are they? 2 and 3. 2 and 3. So, no surprise, you have 2 and 3 here. Okay. So, what are the ones downstream from 6 on the branch? that goes from 6 to 7. 7, 8, 9, no. <laughs> I guess they're not. No? Oh. Ah. Oh. <laughs> okay. Ah, man. Sucks. Alright. <laughs> <laughs> That's a... Uh, remove that. <laughs> You saw that, okay? So you saw router one, right over here. Sorry, Google. <laughs> so you have all those things, right? You have them over there. You have all those tables down here. You know, we have the entire subtree here, the entire subtree of something that is the originator, the source. So in this table, there's something that says. Source S going to 1, 2, and 3. So S to 1. This is a predicate. S to 2. Predicate. And so on. You have all these tables. And now I ask the question what is the complexity of these tables? How many bits do I need to represent these tables? First of all, do you realize that this works? Does it work? Seems to work to me. What's the size of predicates a set? Oh, that's a good question. What are the sizes of the predicates? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Of course, it depends on the size of the predicates. Uh, but let's say that I can give you, a, you know, the predicates are bounded by some value. You know, you don't have, you have predicates that are big as big as, uh, you know, 70 bits, or bytes, or megabytes, I don't know, but you, you can figure it out. I mean, they are well-defined. Um, I'm sorry, it's all good. Huh? The longest entry has as much predicates as, uh, as the tree height. Ah, good, good. We're getting to a good comment here. So, uh, yes, it's true. The the, the tree has branches that go, you know, what's, I have to limit the, or the total number of predicates that I associate with router tables in every node depend on the diameter of the network in that case, right? Or the length of the longest uh, tree.
Maybe the maximum complexity for every router, for the total complexity across the network. How do we do that? I have a, uh, I have, actually, the, the analysis of this is not that difficult, if you really think about it. Let's say, for example, that we limit the size of the predicates to a known max value. And uh, essentially, we have to count, we have to count for every vertex, the memory of the init function, the memory of the header function, the memory of the boarding function. Now, the init function, remember, in here we produce a header that is simply the source. So, we look at the source, the source has a function that just puts its own name in it. How many bits do you need to, that, to do that? Zero, because it's a constant function. Okay, so zero bits for that, or just order one bits. Mm -hmm. What about the header function? Actually, this is, okay, you don't, you don't need zero bits, you need its own ID. What's the ID? That's the log of the size of the network. Okay, rough. Order of log n. n is the size of the network. What's the header function? The header function simply copies the input to the output header, it doesn't change the header. So that's zero bits, that's zero. And it's all about the formatic function. Okay, so it's all about that. Let's count how many are those, and we'll get to essentially what you were saying. Counting those means counting, now we can count this this way, or we can count it like this, meaning the total amount of memory for all the tables is the total amount of memory for all the trees, okay? So let's count the trees. How heavy is every tree? And how heavy is the tree depends on how big the tree is. So we have every predicate that is associated with every link in the tree. So a predicate down here is associated with this, 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 and all the links up to the root of the tree. That's what that thing says. Uh, so pretty much I have the same example here. So if you have a predicate here, the predicate here is going to count add bits to the memory that stores this edge this edge and that edge. So it's effectively the size of the predicate times one, two, three. Because P7 is going to appear here, here, and here. Hmm? What is the weight of P3? One, two, three for this particular tree. Okay. So how does it work? We can count the predicate, the size of the predicate, times the distance between the source and x. And we add that up over all uh, x's in the receiver set. I'm going to cut it short because you understand what that is. Effectively, this is the result. So you have a fixed amount. This is the amount for the header function, excuse me, the unit function. And this is the amount for every source times every receiver, times the size of the predicate, times d. What is d? d is the average distance between two processes. Okay, so this is the size, the memory complexity. So when you study this, as an engineer, after, you know, we, I played mathematician for two seconds, you know, with sums and multiplications. There's a log in the last one. We understand it. So, okay, so you play a little bit with this and then you look at this product and say, oh, this is, gonna, this is pretty heavy, right? Because this is, the sources, well, everybody can be a source, so that's N. Destination, receivers, everybody can be a receiver, so that's N. So this is N squared. Bad, really bad. And so then you start to, that's, that's when you start to be smart and say, okay, now I gotta be smart. I gotta do things so that the complexity bounds are really not that bad. And how do you do that? Well, in the case of the predicates, you can do it 
um, in, a, in a bunch of ways. Let me go through this. And the main trick is this. The main trick is, remember, everything had to be this, like this, a predicate that is the disjunction of everything? Well, maybe, maybe. It's not true that the size of this is equal to the size of the, every individual element. Why? Well, because the size of, a, of an expression, this junction, another expression, this junction, another expression, maybe allows you to simplify some of the expressions. Because the or, maybe you're saying the or of the same thing. So you can you know, sort of factor it out. Now I'm going to spend more time on that. You get the intuition. Maybe this factor, which we call the disjunction advantage, is less than one. Meaning that the size of this is smaller than the size of, the, of the, its components. So we can be smart about that. And in fact, again, taking the hat of the engineer now, I tried it. I mean, you can, well, I can play mathematician for two seconds and then engineer. <laughs> play mathematician for the, the two seconds. Let's try that. If we, if we play mathematician and say, what's the expected size of the predicate over if this n is the size of the, um, the, the, the denominator is easy because that's just the size of elements n times the size of the predicate. Okay? Random sets of size n. They're predicates, so they're random sets. I mean, we assume, let's assume that they are random sets of size n. Okay, that's n h. Okay, fine. What is the size of this? Well, assuming a uniform distribution, that's essentially the expected size of the union of n random sets over a universe of size, size of m. Okay, what is that? Uh, if you do the math, you get to something like that. You get to this. Okay, so this expression tells you that, well, maybe this is not super easy at the beginning, but you can see that as you increase the number here uh, of, effectively, the n is, is the crucial uh, unknown variable here, this thing decreases, it goes down. Uh, what that means is that as you add predicates, the the total size is sublinear. So the total size is not that you add predicates and you spend more bits. You add predicates and you spend less and less bits every time. And if you take this, and again, mathematicians, no, engineer, turn to engineering. This, this is, by the way, this is the function. This is it, with uniform distribution. And this is with a zip distribution, even better. You understand why it's better? Because uniform is, if I take two sets at random, the chances of them colliding is whatever it is. If I take them with any other distribution that is not uniform, there's a more, a higher chance of them colliding. And I like collisions because they reduce the total size, right? Okay, so if you take another distribution that isn't uniform, alpha goes down very quickly. So again, mathematicians out, engineers in, and then you take a real system with real predicates, with expressions, and you run a Monte Carlo simulation of them and compute the average, uh, the, uh, excuse me, the, the reduction factor. This is the median, this is 95 percentile, this is 5 percentile, and this is, or, yeah, I mean, those two, and uh, this is min and max. Look at here, if you, if you pump many predicates, this is, you know, predicates. Remember when we talked about the preferences? I have 50 preferences, and there's a billion people like me. So that's 50 billion. Where are we? Well, this is 1 million. So, as you go and add preferences, what, what is this saying? What is this saying, realistically? It's saying, if people express preferences, the more people you have expressing preferences, the more you have likelihood of preferences being the same. So you don't have to store all of them. Okay? So, yes, Google engineers would say, oh, yeah, I can save space because I have a lot of clients, and a lot of clients have similar preferences. You know, everybody in St. Petersburg wants to know what, you know, <laughs> what the team in St. Petersburg does. Okay, so they're playing some German team tonight. So all the Germans want to know that. 
but they all want to know the same thing. That's what this thing says. You add predicates, and you have a higher and higher reduction of the size. And I did this for many distributions, uh, for different distribution of attributes, for different numbers of attributes, and they're all pretty good. Uh, and so, in summary for this part, and I'm really way out of time, uh, I'm, uh, I'm interested in, in finding both the theoretical bounds um, in some given models. Ideally, I would love to find the lower bounds, meaning bounds that are true no matter what the algorithm is. So they express properties of the problem itself, not properties of the algorithms. Problems of the, excuse me, properties of the problem itself. I would love to find those. Those are difficult. And, uh, and also just a way to engineer the system. And, you know, in concrete cases, you know, give me bounds, give me some uh, ways to engineer the system. So let me go straight to the conclusion here uh, of, uh, uh, well, these are the references. Essentially, the conclusions are just this one slide. I think there are many applications and problems related to this. Routing, theoretical frameworks, design and engineering, security and privacy, many others in this area of content-based networking. And they combine several disciplines. So I like to play networking guy. Um, I like to play algorithms guy. I'm not, I mean, I'd love to be smart enough to study these things, but I mean, I study them, but I'm not that good at producing new ones. But it's also a lot of systems work. So if you like to do implementation work, you can combine a lot of those things, both networking systems, algorithms and systems, and a little bit of software too for the practice, you know, for the middleware design, all that. And uh, I left uh, also some uh, references here. Um, the, these two are, these are some of the heavy papers that we published in this area. And, uh, and some of the new ones have the ideas of this is the one that has the, the theory part. And this uh, sensor network. Okay. So, uh, so I'm really now done with the presentation. And I don't know what the plan is, but uh, if you, I'm obviously happy to take questions now, or if people want to leave and talk to me in, in private, that's, that's cool as well. Uh, otherwise, I'm supposed to be here the next couple of days, but I, I, I will Okay, so I'm done, and uh, you know, questions, if you have any or not. Okay, that's it. I'll see you later.